crisis, I don't think I realized at first what was happening uh, because I descended. Uh, my symptoms got worse over the course of about a month. And uh, eventually to the point where I couldn't swallow uh, at all. So I couldn't eat or drink anything. Um, and I had a lot of fear that I was going to choke. Um, and I ended up in the hospital getting further treatment. And it was terrifying. Um, I describe it to people by saying I felt like I was drowning every day because the secretions in your throat have no way to clear them. And so they just feel like they're slowly falling down your throat. And the fear is if you drink something that you can't swallow properly, you can aspirate um, and end up with pneumonia. So it essentially felt like I was drowning 24 hours a day for upwards of a month, um, which was terrifying. Um, and it wasn't until the treatment started to work uh, that I started to feel less anxious. Um, but I think knowing that that can happen anytime to me uh, means that the anxiety over a crisis is always there. And that's when I started on um, high dose steroids uh, and long term immunosuppressants to try to kick me out of the crisis, which worked um, about 10 days later. But it did involve uh, spending three or four days in the ICU uh, before before getting better. So for me, the process like that, that whole uh, crisis, I would I would say lasted four or five weeks. Um, but I, I think they can last less time and they can last a lot more time, which is uh, scary to not really know um, when you'll come out of it. And I think the fear over that is essentially the suffering that comes with being intubated um, while the treatments begin to work uh, and you are able to breathe and swallow on your own again. When it comes to coping with a chronic illness, um, sometimes... I think it's almost easier after you've been diagnosed because uh, the symptoms in advance of diagnosis can be very confusing. Once I formally had a myasthenia diagnosis, I felt uh, somewhat more confident in understanding how it would affect my life and what treatment options were available to me. A concern I have with my current MG treatment <laughs> is the possible long-term side effects of non-steroidal uh, immunosuppressants. And uh, I would love to be on uh, medication that doesn't have these long-term side effects, but I don't know if those currently exist right now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kurt Clayfeld, the Managing Director of the CME Institute. Thank you for joining us for this important and timely webcast. Our chairperson today is Dr. Vera Brill, who is with the Division of Neurology at the University of Toronto and University Health Network. I will hand the meeting over to her to introduce Dr. Silvestri and Dr. Barnett Tapia. Dr. Brill? It's my pleasure to be here from the University of Toronto and to welcome my uh, colleagues who are co-faculty, uh, starting with Carolina Barnett Tapia, also from my institution, um, and Nicholas Silvestri, who is not far away at the University of Buffalo uh, in the US and uh, um, a good colleague. Uh, Dr. Silvestri is going to talk uh, about where we are now. Dr. Barnett is going to talk about the gaps. And then I'll be talking about uh, some new treatments and the FC receptor inhibitor story. Uh, so now I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Silvestri, who will start us off. So just to start us off, myasthenia gravis, as many know, is the prototypical autoimmune disease, and it's caused by autoantibodies, and predominantly these antibodies are against the acetylcholine receptor. Uh, they can also be against musk or LRP4, and there is a small percentage of patients where we don't uh, know which antibodies they have. We term them as uh, triple seronegative, and their antibodies are yet to be identified. Myasthenia gravis has a bimodal age distribution. It tends to occur in people around 30 years of age, and then again, around 50 or 60 years of age. And in the younger age group, females predominate, uh, predominate at a ratio of about seven to one, whereas in the older age group, there's a slight male predominance. The incidence is pretty low, as, as well as the prevalence. Uh, we estimate in the United States, there's anywhere from 60 to 80,000 patients 
with myasthenia gravis. In terms of pathophysiology, I'll restrict my comments to the most common form of myasthenia, the acetylcholine receptor mediated, uh, antibody mediated disease. And uh, in this case, the antibodies lead to impaired neuromuscular transmission and therefore weakness in our patients by a number of different mechanisms. One of those mechanisms may be by attaching to the acetylcholine receptor and activating complement, causing complement-mediated lysis of the neuromuscular junction. It can cause accelerated internalization and degradation of the acetylcholine receptors, not making them available for neuromuscular transmission. Or it can lead to direct blockade of the acetylcholine receptors, so attaching and functionally blocking the receptors from uh, receiving acetylcholine and therefore causing neuromuscular transmission. Myasthenia gravis is a very uh, unique disorder in that it leads to fatigable weakness. Uh, the fatigable weakness tends to predominate in ocular and bulbar muscles, and it tends to cause uh, ptosis or eyelid droop, as well as double vision or diplopia. It can cause dysphagia, dysarthria, dysphonia, or chewing difficulty. In its most severe form, it can cause dyspnea or orthopnea, and it can lead to weakness uh, of the muscles of the body, uh, axial muscles such as the neck muscles leading to dropped head syndrome, or for the most part, proximally predominant limb weakness, though there are distal forms of myasthenia. In terms of making the diagnosis, uh, the diagnosis is history, history, history. So a patient with fatigable weakness, which is predominant in the oculobulbar muscles, is myasthenia until proven otherwise. On examination, we can test for fatigability. Uh, we can have patients stare at our fingers and see if we, they develop diplopia on sustained upgaze. We can try to push their muscles, their proximally predominant muscles, their deltoids and iliopsoas, until we can get them to fatigue. Or we can use a very expensive piece of medical machinery, an ice pack, and put it on a totic lid uh, to see if that totic lid will actually improve, uh, as is the case uh, as occurs in myasthenia. As I mentioned before, myasthenia is due to uh, autoantibodies in most cases. In about 85% of patients, it's due to acetylcholine receptors around 7% musk and about 1% LRP4, and these are all commercially available tests that we can send. In complicated cases or in seronegative cases, we can do electrophysiology, such as repetitive nerve stimulation or single fiber electromyography. And then we can also do an endrophonium test or a tensilon test, which is a short-acting intravenous acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, which will transiently lead to improvement in weakness in patients with generalized myasthenia gravis. So where are we today in terms of treat, treating myasthenia gravis? Luckily, we have many available treatments, but that being said, as we'll talk about, uh, these treatments uh, do have uh, side effects, uh, and uh, at times there is a need for more, more treatments in, in GMG. Uh, we can uh, do a thymectomy in a patient. Um, we can uh, remove their thymus. Uh, we can use immunosuppressive therapies, uh, such as oral immunosuppressants. Uh, we can use intravenous immunoglobulin. Uh, or fetoneonatal receptor antagonists, complement inhibitors, or acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, such as uh, pyridostigmine. We have a list of different uh, medications we can use. The more commonly used uh, oral immunosuppressants are mycophenolate, azathioprine, tacrolimus, uh, methotrexate, uh, as well as using steroids to broadly immunosuppress patients. Many patients with myasthenia, if not all patients with myasthenia, at some point are probably put on steroids. In terms of the uh, treatment paradigm, uh, there is some variability here. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, one of the great things about taking care of patients with myasthenia is that no one patient is like another, and that there are several nuances taking into account patients' uh, age, comorbidities, other medications that we have to account for when we're prescribing medications. However, in the case of younger patients with myasthenia, uh, arbitrarily defined as 50 years or younger, and those that have acetylcholine receptor antibodies, we know that a thymectomy may be helpful. Certainly in those patients with a thymoma or a malignant tumor of the thymus, we also have to offer thymectomy. However, if patients don't respond optimally to the thymectomy, we might consider uh, trying them on immunosuppressants a year or so, or sometimes even sooner after the thymectomy. In patients who are uh, older than 50 years of age, or those who don't want a thymectomy, uh, we often will start with a trial of pyridostigmine but in generalized myasthenia gravis, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors in and of themselves are rarely uh, potent enough or rarely effective enough to treat completely. So we're often moving on to steroids and then the use of steroid sparing agents, such as those medications I mentioned before. And if those patients don't adequately respond, we consider either a trial of another immunosuppressant or more aggressive forms of therapy, such as ecolizumab or rituximab. And in the case of musk myasthenia, we often go to uh, rituximab quite early as it's a quite effective therapy in the treatment of this particular disorder. There are multiple considerations that we need to take into account. 
Um, there are limitations of the current therapies. Uh, there's a variable time of onset. Uh, it can take some of the oral immunosuppressants I mentioned, about 12 months in the case of azathioprine, maybe even 18 months to work. Not all of the routes of administration are convenient. Uh, we have predominantly oral and intravenous routes at, this, at the current time. There are a myriad side effects of currently available therapies. As I'll also talk about, the efficacy is not helpful in, in every single patient. And some of these medications that we have to treat patients with myasthenia are quite expensive, and we have to, to some extent, remain cost conscious in our prescribing habits. In terms of side effects, um, these are seen in about two thirds of patients with myasthenia, according to the literature. Uh, many of the medications, being immunosuppressants, increase the risk of infection and long term possibly malignancy. They can lead to dysglycemia, high blood pressure, uh, they can lead to osteoporosis hepatotoxicity, nephrotoxicity, as well as mood disorders, predominantly depression and anxiety, in the case of steroids, sometimes psychosis. And as I mentioned, these therapies don't work for everyone. Uh, one, one of, again, the great parts about treating patients with myasthenia is it's not a one-size-fits-all treatment regimen, uh, and uh, some therapies uh, lead to side effects in some patients, some th therapies work for patients, but some of the currently available therapies still uh, have limited efficacy. And so uh, patients remain quite debilitated in some cases by their disease is measured by certain scores like the MGADL, the MGII, the uh, MGQOL, uh, uh, despite current therapy. So the point uh, that I wanna make is that though we have many therapies available to us today in the treatment of generalized myasthenia gravis, there are still many patients that suffer from the burden of treatment uh, insofar as side effects or inconvenience or uh, burden of disease because they're myasthenia gravis is not yet optimally controlled. We really do need to be striving for minimally symptomatic uh, or asymptomatic in our patients. I've been very lucky that uh, myasthenia at a macro level hasn't had a significant impact on my life plans because um, I was able to uh, finish law school, I'm a full-time practicing lawyer, I have a husband and a baby and a toddler. Um, but I think it's important to understand that on a micro level, I think my senior affects my life plans every day. Uh, it's a factor in uh, what I do every day. Am I getting enough sleep? Am I getting enough rest? Are the um, the, the physical activities am I doing, are they too much for me that um, it's going to uh, bring about more symptoms? I know what it's like to decline into a crisis and my number one life goal is to avoid doing that again. No one could tell me how long it would last and every day, I remember being in the ICU and every time the neurologist would come visit me once a day and I would say to him, how much longer is this gonna last? Like how much longer before the treatment start to work? And he, there was no real way for him to answer that question for me. Uh, I was in the hospital for two weeks. Uh, and when I got better after receiving IVIG, I went home, uh, but that wasn't enough on its own uh, to pull me out of the crisis. And about two weeks later, I lost the ability to swallow and uh, uh, talk again. We went back to the hospital and said to them, I'm getting worse every day and I know I'm gonna end up in crisis again. Uh, but they sent me home. And in hindsight, I really wish I had fought harder for myself because I stayed at home for another four or five days until I couldn't breathe. And we went to the hospital and that was the day that they rushed me to the resuscitation room to put an NG tube in my nose and into my stomach so they could get the medication in and I ended up in the ICU. And I knew that that was gonna happen because I was continuing to get worse, but no one has the experiences that you have where you understand what your normal is and how your normal is declining. And so uh, going forward, I know that I will ensure that I advocate for myself to make sure that that doesn't happen again.